song here, so. I don't know how, uh, how do you follow something where the Spirit of God is already moving and He's already pricking your hearts and opening your minds. You know, I have a friend in Asheville, North Carolina. His name's Pastor Rocky. And Pastor Rocky always says, you know, Kai, I want to be a part of something that stirs God's heart. Because it should stir my heart. What stirs God's heart, does that stir your heart? Does that make sense? What moves God, what excites God, does that excite you or could you give a rip? And I think it's fair to say that revival is happening. What I mean by that is, is that when we talk about revival, that's all we do is talk about it. But when people come forward after Michael says, hey, come forward if the Spirit of God is moving, folks, embrace that and start running with it. Don't go back and say, now I'm praying for revival. It's already starting in your heart. And yet we go back and say, I'm going to have another prayer movement asking God to revive my heart. It's already starting. So what are you waiting for? The church is in business of waiting. My favorite people to interact in cities are pastors because they're waiting for God to move. Romans 13, 11, though, I say this as our time of prayer to launch into this is based on Romans 13, 11. It says, do this, knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. Now, I'll be the first to confess, I'm not Baptist. I don't know if I'm the only one in the room that's not Baptist. Regardless if you're Baptist or not, I believe now is the time for the Lord to awaken your soul. And believe it or not, I believe it could happen in the state of Alabama. And when you come forward, don't do it unless you mean it. And if you mean it, mark this as a Joshua Stone moment. And say, God is moving in my life and I want to see a revival. Because I want to be a part of something that stirs God's heart. And yet we play the game so well. Lord, I just commit this time. Spirit of God, move in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, it's been about a month um, that I've been praying for y'all. And the Lord kept taking me to the strangest text. Have you guys ever done that as pastors? You just sought the Lord and you're like, really God, this text isn't going to go over well with people. I don't care. Because it says in 2 Timothy 1, 7 that God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power, love, and a sound mind. If God tells you to do it, do it. Go to Luke 15 if you would please. Luke 15, 1 through 7. I'm not really a complicated guy. Just for the record, I've got three little kids, six, five, and three, and I got one on the way. They're all girls. The fourth one, praise the Lord, is a boy. <laughs> and I'm right there with you in this battle. I'm right there trugging along. As Michael talks about, we are in a warfare. Do the Baptists really believe that? I believe you do, or you wouldn't have a theme of revival in this conference. Go with me in verse 1 of Luke 15. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Yeah, this is interesting to me. It says the word now, but importantly, it says all the tax collectors. It doesn't say some, it says all. You know, Kent Hughes writes in one of his commentaries, you know, you guys, you know, that you're the pastors, you know this stuff. Tax collectors were loathed. Synagogues won't accept their alms. Their testimonies weren't received in the Jewish courts. They were held to be worse than a heathen. And then at the same time, you have all these tax collectors coming to Jesus, and now it says you got all the sinners. Anybody ever thought, what does that look like? All the sinners were being drawn to Jesus to listen to him. I love this because Kent Hughes says either one, tax collectors or sinners, were in desperate need of redemption. 
Now, if I was to pull back and let's play a reality card for a second. Does anybody know how many counties are in Alabama? 67. Anybody know what the largest county is? Jefferson County. Anybody know what the smallest county is in Alabama? Greene County. Anybody from Greene County? That'd probably be like the Nazareth deal, right? You know what good can come from Greene County? I just, that's nothing personal. And out of the 67 counties, you have a population, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, here in the state of Alabama, of about 4.8 million people. What's interesting is, according to, yes, the American Religious Identification Survey, A-R-I-S, you guys have about 80% Christians in this state. I, I, really? I don't know, but I just I, I want to report these statistics. But out of those statistics of the 4.8 million, do you know how many people claim to be, listen to this description, atheist, agnostic, humanist, free thinker, skeptic, bright, agnostic, materialistic, and naturalist. Out of that group of people, according to the Secular Coalition for Alabama, which they represent the non-theistic Alabama people, 11% in this state say, I want nothing to do with God. 11%. They call themselves the nun. Literally, N-O-N-E, none. I want nothing to do with your God. And you know what we do with those people? We treat them like the tax collectors and the sinners. We can't touch them. Why would we hang out with them? And so here you have 528,000 people going straight to hell, and the church is intimidated by these people. You want to break up the 67 counties by the 500... And 28,000, I know there's a math major out there. It's probably a little less than 8,000 per county. Now, I know that's Green County's pretty much their population, but you get my point. There are lost people in every single county. And you say, Kyle, why do you talk about this? This is a revival conference because I believe when you come forward right here, this is so timely. You start doing what's down here out there. And then people are naturally attracted to you, not because you look good or you smell good, but because you have Jesus Christ in you. You want to see a move of God in the state of Alabama? Believe it or not, there's 528,000 people waiting for somebody to introduce a relationship of Jesus Christ to them. And yet, I'm sorry to say, most of you are older in this room. Where are the young people, guys? You know, one of the gentlemen this morning spoke about the percentages in the years. You know what? If you don't start bringing them along now, SBC will be done and gone in 15, 20 years. Robert Coleman, my mentor who wrote Master Plan of Evangelism, he literally took me alongside and said, Kyle, if I don't pour into you, who will? And I love this because this, when you came forward, is a great start to seeing the change of Alabama. But you have to ask yourself, do you believe this? That the state of Alabama can change. I love this. Every time I look, they call themselves Alabamians. Is that right? Better than Alabamites. Because everybody knows if it ends in ites, it ain't good. I'll say this. At least the tax collectors and sinners knew something more than sometimes the church knows. They know that if they draw near to him, as it says in James 4, he will draw near to them. I was in Asheville for the last seven months, literally going back and forth. And, you know, if I was to categorize a group for me, who's a group that's just weird that you wouldn't touch? Anybody know about this Occupy Wall Street movement? Dude, those people are some weird people. I've hung out with them, trust me. Occupy Dallas, Occupy Asheville. Did you know you have an Occupy Mobile, Mobile, Alabama? Every Saturday since October, they've been meeting. Man, they got the dreads, they got the tats, they got the earplugs, they got the crazy good look, right? I decided to go to Asheville and hang out with a guy named Josh. 
And I went to this guy. I didn't know him. They were under the bridge of 240. And I began to think, Jesus hung out with these people. Why wouldn't I? I want to pull back just for a second. A lot of us, when we preach on revival, we do big generalizations. And this is not something that the guys have done this morning. I'm just saying we make generalizations. This message is not for the church. This message is for you. This message is for you. You know, you talk about Michael, the intercessors. Uh, I have an old school phone. I got to type in, you know, the A, B. You got to, I mean, it's really old school. And all morning, all I've been doing is asking for more intercession, more intercession for you. Because I believe if you get it, your church will get it. Which then your community will get it. So as I'm hanging out with this guy, Josh, under the bridge, I say, hey, man, you don't know me at all, but I'd, I'd like to come wash your feet. He said, you want to do what? In order to connect with our culture, you still have to be radical. I mean, you compromise, but it means you be radical. And Fox and Michael, the guys of Occupy Asheville, this is really quite classic. They said, well, we're security. You can't do that here. I was like, no, anybody can come to these Occupy movements because everybody has their own voice. Have you heard of the human megaphone? If I speak, then you all have to speak exactly what I say. Their, their interactions take forever. And I said, I'd like to wash your feet. He said, no. So as I'm walking away, literally walking away, Michael comes running after me, and he grabs my arm, and he says, hey, that whole Jesus thing you want to do, you can come back at 2 o'clock and do it. So I grabbed seven people. We came back at 2 o'clock, and I came up to Joshua, and I said, man, I'm, I'm, just, I'm here to wash your feet. <laughs> he said, why are you doing this? I said, because it's what's in the good book. And you know what he did? He went and got the 30 tents, the people that we label are weird, and he grabbed them by their arms and he said, sit down. This guy's here to wash your feet. And literally over an hour, all I did with people from all over the United States is we washed feet. And I looked at Joshua and I said, Joshua, how would you identify yourself? And he said, it's funny you ask, and he had a nicer phone than I did. And he pulled out his list and listen, listen to how he described himself as a sinner. My question is, is, do you think of yourself like this? This is his list. Joshua from Occupy Asheville under Bridge 240. He says, I'm a belligerent idiot. A person without a home, job, or property. A ship abandoned on high sea. Worn or broken down by hard times. Failing in what duty requires, forsaken by owner, in deplorable condition, abandoned, deserted, ruined, neglected, discarded, forsaken, dilapidated, neglected, slack, irresponsible, careless, lack, vermis, tramp, bum, outcast, drifter, vagrant, hobo, down and out, and vagabond. And he was drawn to my Jesus. You know, the crazy thing to me is, is that the church thinks sometimes that those actions and interacting with those people is not for us. I'm just going to challenge you. If you want to see the state of Alabama change, you need to start being radical for the Lord. Do not expect people to come strolling through your doors. Yeah, they'll be drawn to you because the Spirit of God is moving, but the reality is, is they don't care about your religion. They don't care about your bill. They don't care. My generation does not care. They don't even care about your doctrine. What they care about, though, is are you authentic? Are you real? And I love this because it throws the Pharisees and the scribes off. If you look in verse 2, it says, Both the Pharisees and the scribes they began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners, and he eats with them. In other words, they're talking these thoughts out loud. I don't understand this because have you ever had a fight with your wife, and as you're walking away, you say it so she can hear you, but you're really not saying it out loud? My daughters do it to me all the time. I think that's what happened to these guys. They're like, I can't believe Jesus hangs out with sinners. Just state the obvious. When's the last time you had a good dinner with a sinner? I am exhausted of the holy huddle. They labeled Jesus as having a receptive heart for sinners. They labeled Jesus as having a higher tendency to eat with sinners. 
And in the ancient world, if you associated yourself with somebody at the table, it meant you were like-minded. And I love this. Warren Wearsby says, Jesus attracted sinners while Pharisees repelled them. You know, as I have a daily radio program, the biggest thing that I hear, the biggest thing that I hear is the hypocrisy. I meet with people on the streets every week. I did it in Mobile, Alabama today. I'll tell you the story at the very end. We isolate ourselves. We isolate ourselves. Jesus was with the sinners and the tax collectors, and the Pharisees are having a hard time with this. In fact, man, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not a coat guy. It's, I, I tried. I'm sorry. I tried. You know, we know what it says in Scripture in 2 Corinthians 6, don't we? And it says, you know, not, don't be bound together with the unbelievers. You know, don't be this whole unequally yoked with believers. But yet Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, go eat with them. Do a gut check. Remember, not your church, you. When's the last time you have actually sat down with people who don't know Jesus and you shared with them how Jesus has changed your life? Your people are watching you. And if you ain't doing it, guess what? They ain't doing it either. And I told two ladies, two women, Gloria and Joyce today, off of Dublin Street in Ghent, there's a little barber shop. Anybody ever heard of Maysville Barber Shop? Yeah, don't worry. And I said to Gloria and Joyce, if you're not the salt of the earth, and let me put it a different way, the salt of the earth cannot be salty if it's not with the meat. The light of the world can't shine the light unless you're with the darkness. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so Jesus decided to say, okay guys, I want to tell you a simple story. And we're going to just fly through this story. I have a friend named Percy, an African-American guy out of Flint, Michigan. And every time you preach, in the middle of your sermon, this is what he says. Make it simple, brother. Keep it plain. Imagine if in the middle of your services, I don't know, do, do SBC people yell out in the middle of their services? You guys won't even say anything, you're that nervous. It's okay. But imagine as you're, as, you're, as you're preaching the Word of God, he says, keep it simple. I remember I asked Percy one time in Sedona, Arizona, as he came out, I said, am I not making it simple enough in the middle of the sermon? He says, you are, but remember, Jesus kept it simple. Our generation, outside these walls, think you have made it too complicated. If my child, who is six years old, can embrace Jesus, why don't we make it harder than what it is? If we want to play the academic games, I've done the doctoral route. In my studies, it never once said make it complicated. I know I'm being repetitive, but you know how people learn? Repetition. How many people are in the state of Alabama? Do you guys remember? 4.8 million. How many counties are in this state? 67. Do you know how many people, what's the percentage that say, I don't want anything to do with God? 11%. Do you know what that equates to? How many people total per thousand? 528,000. This morning they talked about being bold for your prayers. What if you started praying for 528,000 people to come to know Christ in the state of Alabama? I guarantee you the SBC would come alive. Because you have the same vision. You have the same direction. You have the same motivation. And it's not to enhance your church. It's to enhance the kingdom of God. I believe, I believe this. this is a very true statement that from now on the way that we are going to see a move of God is, is that the denominations, the ministries, the names of the pastors are going to be wiped out. I don't mean that you're not going to still do it. I just mean if you want to see a move of God, it means the Baptists, the Methodists, the Charismatics all work together. You cannot change Mobile, Alabama by yourself as Baptists. But you can do it with some Methodists. 
They, you can. Listen to this in verse 4. What man among you, Jesus is saying, what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? We are so concerned, aren't we, with our flock that we forget about the one. I went to Maysville Barbershop today because of one thing. Anybody get Sports Illustrated? Jamarcus Russell is from this city. You guys know who Jamarcus Russell is? Jamarcus is, used to be the number one draft pick out of, for the Oakland Raiders, guy out of LSU, just a monster of a guy and claims to know the Lord, but he hangs out with a bunch of guys at a barbershop all the time. As I was praying for this conference, that article came and I started praying for Jamarcus and Maysville Barbershop. So I went there over lunch today. I was not planning on going there today with this story. And as I went and knocked on the little barbershop off of uh, Dublin Street, they were closed. And I thought, oh man, I missed the boat on the Holy Spirit deal on that one. But I started knocking on three other neighbor's doors. Yes, the little white guy in his cowboy boots and his vest goes to kind of one of the rougher parts of town and started knocking on doors. That one person accused me of being undercover. <laughs> For real. I'm not. And two ladies, Gloria and Joyce, opened their door. They invited me in, and for 30 minutes, we cried out to the Lord. And she said, why are you here? And I said, because in Scripture, it says we're supposed to go after the one sheep. I wasn't praying for Jamarcus. I don't mean that in a bad way. I was praying for a guy named Moses, whose nickname was the black sheep. And I wanted to find that black sheep. Who was announced, I don't want anything to do with this whole God thing. And I went after him. And the best part is, is that Moses wasn't there. All the doors were shut. As I'm praying with glory and joy, I began to understand it's time to man up and go into places where you feel uncomfortable. As Southern Baptists, you've got to kind of roll up your sleeves and get uncomfortable for the gospel. And what I love is, is as I left, Gloria was just weeping. I can't believe God would send somebody from Texas just to pray for me. And she said, here's what I'm going to do for you. Tonight, I'm going to go find Moses. And I'm going to tell him a, God came, a guy came after to talk to him. And she said, but I don't care about you. I'm going to tell him God's coming after you. <laughs> a lot of you are just not even getting it right now. You want to see your church grow? Get out of your box. Go find, you know the barbershop guys? Their names were Black Sheep, Red, and Tree. I wish white people had that cool of a nickname. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> but what's happened is, is that when you initiate it, then they start to follow. The SBC can grow if you initiate it. And Jesus pulls out the man card and says, guys, it's time to start manning up because the lost sheep means to be lost, ruined, or destroyed. They are headed in danger and going to hell. Hell. I said hell. On the radio, you know how many calls I get because I say hell? I can't believe that little young guy. I'm 32 years old. 32-year-old guy always says hell on the radio. <laughs> it's not so funny because they are going there. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. So what do we do about lost sheep? Remember, I'm not asking about the church. I'm asking about you. This is where it gets sticky. This is why I've asked for intercessors. I'm going to read seven verses that I think are going to step on some toes. But you know what? It's in the good book. Hebrews 4 says it's living, active, and piercing. I hope this pierces you. Exodus 34, 1 through 7. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord God, Woe, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourself with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. 
Those who are sickly, you have not strengthened. The deceased, you have not healed. The broken, you have not bound up. The scattered, you have not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and with severity, you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. And they became food for every beast of the field and were scattered. Do you want to know why your church isn't getting it? Because you're getting yourself fat. Church of America. You know the nun group, the N-O-N-E? It's right between 20 to 25 percent that very clearly say, I want nothing to do with God because I believe it's not just a problem in Alabama, it's a problem in Texas. It's a problem in Georgia. It's a problem in California. It's a problem in Michigan. Pastors are more concerned about making sure they're doing okay, which means dollars, which means buildings, which means people coming through the doors, than they are about the own salvation of the flock. How do I know? Kyle, how can you make a generalization? Because our nation is going to hell in a handbasket. Look around. When you come forward, I get so excited. Because just maybe this group will actually do what they're saying they're going to do. Maybe. People are hungry for something. And all it takes is one person saying, hey, I'm here to pray at a barbershop. Can I pray with you? And they lose it. You know what they did? I, this is so unkosher, but I'm going to do it anyway. Joyce gave me this. She said, Kyle, this is all I have to give you. <laughs> she gave me a banana. Folks, it's soft, it's brown, it looks horrible. But because I went out of my way, because the Spirit told me to do that, because we have been empowered by the Spirit to listen to the Spirit, we changed two lives today. Imagine if that's what we started doing. She gave me a banana. <laughs> because when you find the sheep, you can carry them and start rejoicing with them. It's what the text says in verse 5. When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. Do you even care about the lost? The shepherd was responsible for sheep. And if one was missing, according to Warren Wearsby, the shepherd had to pay for it unless he could prove that it was killed by a predator. And this explains why you would leave the other sheep and go find that one because basically it was on his head. Not to find the lost sheep meant money out of his pocket plus the disgrace of being known as a careless shepherd. 4.8 million people in this state of Alabama. I'm just being nice and giving a low number of 528,000 people very clearly say they don't know the Lord. Based on our actions alone, we've got a lot of careless shepherds in this room. Because you're not going out after the sheep. Now, I don't go and do this to prove a point. It's because it's on my heart. Jesus wept over people because he knew where they were going. The reason we're not growing is because we don't care. And that's a pretty simple solution to fix. Ask God to give you the things that stir his heart. And then you'll start doing it. Wake up. Wake up to this truth. Because when you do, the sheep will respond to his voice. I understand that this is a sacrifice for you to do ministry. Guess what? I'm with you. I don't have a salary. I don't have an income. You just trust, right? You just trust. It's a sacrifice. But when you do it, you do it until you're done. I love that when you said, Michael, don't do this. If you quit, you've done it in vain. Jesus did it until when he said, it is finished. 
Some of you are so weary, so tired. You're like, I can't do it anymore. You know when you get life? is when you start pouring into other people. The lost. The lost. You are so energized, so on fire, like, wow, I can really screw this up, and it doesn't matter if the Spirit has prepared them, they'll come to know the Lord. I love this. Matthew 18, 11 says, come to save that whom was lost. Are you doing any seeking today? Do you even care that it says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. Do you want to see a revival in your church? When you come forward or you stay there and you acknowledge, God, I want to see a move of God, then you start doing something about it. My father, my grandfather, our generations have never seen a national move of God in the United States. I was born on the 4th of July. I've studied anything and everything you can think of about America. We haven't seen it. Because I believe all we're doing is waiting and waiting and waiting. Matthew 28 says, go. What are you waiting for? We need ministries like like, like Life Action that you're going to hear from Byron tonight. Saying, guys, let's come together. Let's start crying out to the Lord. But when you hear from God, go. If you don't, it's what happens in 1 Thessalonians. It says you quench the Spirit. We don't don't do that, though, do we? I tell you, I didn't want to go to the barbershop today. Um, And a lot of times we don't want to do things that we don't want to do. But when you come and you go, lives are changed. I can't guarantee the results, nor can you. But your job is just to simply deliver the good news. Whether they accept or reject, it doesn't matter. Verse 6, and when he comes home, we're closing it up here, folks. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. (laughs) Do you know how fun it is to have a party? When's the? This is a real practical question. It's okay to stand up. Have you ever been to a party in the last three weeks because you threw it because somebody came to know Christ? This should happen all the time. In China, it's happening. Even parts of Korea, it's happening. Even parts of Cuba, believe it or not, it's happening. Move of gods are happening because people are coming to know Christ. In America, we're not keeping up with the population of people coming to know Christ and the population. Which means there aren't a whole lot of parties. You want to know how to bring life to your church, how to be revived? Throw a party for a non-believer who came to know Christ. Watch what happens. 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. When you have a party, listen to this. Lots of people begin to rejoice. One is, is the dude who was found, right? That would be all right. At least in Texas, somebody says something. I know, we're not in Texas. Did you know everything's bigger in Texas? I was just waiting for somebody. So listen to this. There's joy in the heart who was found. There's joy in the person who does the finding. And then there's others who are watching, and then there's joy in them. So if I, let me give you a story. So I was in Nashville, North Carolina. You know the whole feet washing story? Started washing feet. There was a guy who looked like Mr. T. His name is Sam Dietrich. Sam wouldn't give me the time or day. In fact, he wouldn't talk to me. He wouldn't look at me. He wouldn't give me his name. Something changed, though. I started praying right then and there. I believe God is an immediate God at times. That means we got to live like Acts 2 and believe that God wants to respond to us now. Believe it or not, there's stuff happening overseas. It's not happening in the United States because we're afraid to be charismatic, aren't we? (laughs) Signs and wonders can happen today. 
Healings can happen today. I started praying over Sam. The guy probably thought I was nuts. I was like, Sam, I'm praying for you. As soon as I was done, he's like, I'd like to sit down and talk with you. I said, Sam, tell me your past. For six prisons, he was put in because he was beating up the guards and the prisoners. They ended, he ended up in San Quentin in California. They didn't know what to do with him. By the end, Sam had come to know the Lord. Now, just hang in there with me on this story. You know, when you share the gospel and you're like, okay, is this really a conversion coming to discipleship? Is this guy just giving me the yes factor? What? Later that night, he came to have a meal with me. He showed up at 5 o'clock and said, I'd like to eat with you. Because remember, Jesus hung out with sinners and they ate. So I followed up and said, I'd like to have dinner. And so he came. As we're sitting, I said, Sam, I have a radio program. Can I play what I recorded? And Sam said, sure. As Sam was listening to himself come to know Christ, he started to weep. I said, Sam, I want to show you a video now of you coming to know Christ. When he saw his picture on the video, he lost it. Mr. T lost it. And I love this because I said, Sam, would you like to get baptized? He said, yes. I said, all right, I'll see you tomorrow at 4 o'clock. Guess what? He stiffed me. What do you do with that? We prayed. We prayed, we prayed, and we prayed. He came the next day, and he showed up and said, I'm so sorry I was late. I said, what happened? He said, I got a job. And I couldn't come because I got two jobs. The next day after he accepted Christ, he got two jobs. And I said, are you ready to get baptized? He said, absolutely. Has anybody ever baptized somebody in the French Broad River in October in Asheville? It's freezing. <laughs> but we brought a pastor, Pastor Jimmy of Santa Fe, because I believe when God... Henry Blackaby says, when God is at work, you go where he's working. Pastor of Santa Fe heard that God was working in Asheville, North Carolina. He came. He heard that I was going to baptize Sam in the Branch Broad River. He said, I got nothing except these clothes. And he jumped in the river. I said, well, I didn't need to get 